All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. The first section is just uh, mostly logistics, so that'll be okay if other folks are coming in during that. I uh, want to welcome you to our uh, webinar today, Digital Literacy and Technology Integration in Adult Basic Skills Education. And Jen and Kathy have a, a great uh, webinar for you today. I think you're really going to enjoy it. A uh, little bit about what will happen today. We are recording, so uh, we'll send out a follow-up email probably next week. Uh, we'll include a link to the webinar recording. The slideshow, Kathy and Jan have agreed to share their uh, uh, slides with everybody. We'll also include a link to the research brief that they're going to be talking about, a uh, transcript of the chat, and a certificate for attending. A uh, little bit about the controls we're going to be using. So we'll use the chat to introduce yourself, which you've always already been doing. Um, we'll also use it to share links. So as Kathy and Jen are talking and they mention uh, different links, we'll try to post them in the chat so you can pull them up and, and have them readily available to you. Uh, also, if you want to ask questions to uh, the presenters or to the group, you can put those in the chat as well. Uh, we will have uh, uh, open things up for questions after the end of their presentation. Then we're going to uh, do some breakout rooms and we'll have some sharing at the end as well. If you'd like to ask your question orally or, or share uh, some thoughts or reflections, we're going to ask that you raise your hand. We'll call on you. Uh, you'll unmute yourself, say we're what you have to say or ask your question and then mute yourself again. You can raise your hand by looking at that black bar on the bottom of your screen, clicking on reactions, and then there'll be a big raise hand button that you can click on. Um, you can find our upcoming webinars at proliteracy.org slash webinars. We have one more webinar next week in this series about learner recruitment. And then we also have a webinar this week, uh, our director's perspective on human resource management. And then we're going to be taking a uh, break during the summer so we can prepare for our conference coming up in the fall in San Antonio. So if you're looking for something to do late September, I would encourage you to uh, check that out. All right, a little bit about the agenda, and then I'm going to turn things over to Elisa. Uh, so, Elisa is going to talk about the research briefs in general. Jen and Kathy are going to talk about the research brief that they did. We're going to have uh, uh, questions once they're done with their presentation. Then we're going to break out into some small groups of about eight to ten people. Uh, we're going to ask you to talk about kind of two primary questions. What's something you've tried that's related to this research and what's something you're interested in trying? Then we'll all come back together and just kind of share final reflections. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Alisa. Thank you so much, Todd, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much to ProLiteracy for sponsoring the um, these webinars and the research briefs that came before them. So I'm Alisa Belzer. I'm a professor at Rutgers University. And my connection to this is I was the series, I am the series editor. Um, and so I get the privilege of introducing all the authors that I invited to write the research briefs. Today's presenters and authors of the research brief on integrating technology are Dr. Jen Vanek and Dr. Kathy Harris. Just a brief bio on each of them. Dr. Vanek is the director of digital, Le digital learning and research at the Ed Tech Center at World Education. She's a researcher, teacher educator, and professional learning facilitator who focuses on digital literacy, online learning, classroom technology integration, and English literacy and language learning. As part of that work, Jen facilitates the IDEAL Consortium, that's I-D-E-A-L, a community of practice that supports adult basic education practitioners and administrators to develop quality educational opportunities for adult learners. Jen is currently leading a field test of features of Adobe Reader that make it easier to read digital text. And Dr. Kathy Harris is the director of the Literacy, Language, and Technology Research Group at Portland State University in the Department of Applied Linguistics. 
Her current work focuses on the importance of digital literacies for adults without strong foundational skills and those whose first language is not English for purposes of health, work, education, and life skills, as well as the ways to integrate those skills into English language instruction. So I welcome both Jen and Kathy um, and thank them again for presenting today. So, um, Todd, if you go to the next slide, just a word about the research briefs. Um, Pro-Literacy published uh, five research briefs this past year. We were busy during COVID year. Um, on the topics that you see here, each one of these uh, briefs has then or will then have a webinar as follow-up or just really as introduction, I guess I should say, to the research briefs. The purpose of the briefs was to provide the field with a short, very approachable summary of what do we know in these topics um, so that when you go to you know, look for information, this could be a really good first go-to on each of these topics. And do note that we're now in the works to do two more, which will come out in the coming year, one on motivation and one on creating inclusive classroom spaces. Um, and so we urge you to take a look at the full uh, research brief, which isn't very long given its name. Um, I think Todd just put the link in the chat, but if you lose the link or you want to find it at some other point, just go to the Pro Literacy webpage, look under resources and publications, and you'll find them. There's the link. Um, so that's the research brief. And with that, um, I think you can go to the next slide. I think actually we're going to stop sharing and let uh, Jen and Kathy share. Oh, great. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jen and Kathy. So thank you. While they're getting their slides up and ready, I'll just say that if you have questions as they're present presenting, please just put them in the chat or jot them down to yourself. As Todd said, we will have a Q&A at the end. I'll be monitoring the chat and keeping my eyes out for specific questions for our presenters. Uh, so we will have time to get questions answered. So go ahead, Jen and Kathy. Great, thank you. Thanks so much for having us here today. We're gonna give you a whirlwind and very uh, concise tour of the paper, which of course you can check out on your own to dive more deeply into. Um, we'll talk a little bit first about our work together. Kathy and I have been collaborating for over a decade on different projects going to frame the issue for you. I mean, I guess if you don't understand why this issue is important yet, um, we'll hope to convince you with a few compelling statistics, and then we'll move into the actual description of, of the work. So uh, first, one sec, I just want to frame some current research that Kathy and I are working on together. We got a grant about two and a half years ago from the Walmart Foundation in order to explore the um, characteristics of 21st century learning ecosystems um, specifically with respect to understanding how technologies might be employed or how learners might succeed in employer supported education opportunities. Um, this is a very exciting work for both of us. It builds on both the, the, the prior work at the LLTR <clears throat> that was started with Steve Reeder with the longitudinal study of adult learners and then with the, the learner web work that, that came after that and numerous studies on digital literacy and supports for learners around digital literacy connected with that. Um, so we just this is just a little a quick plug to encourage you to check out the website. We have um, close to 25 blogs that we've been um, we've been posting as we've had insights into our research and we would love it if you could tag along with that work. Um, tangentially related to digital literacy, but certainly um, an important project, I think, for you to follow along with. Um, so with that, Kathy, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Jen. So the imperative, it's like, why is this so, whoops, why is this so important? Well, it's so important because of the fact that 18 million households do not have broadband internet access. They don't have the internet access through uh, something that's always on and higher than dial-up. And if you break that apart by level of education, race, or ethnicity, the, the statistic is more even more dire. So that's one of the reasons we feel like this is so important. Um, 32 million adults cannot use a computer effectively. They cannot do the things that they need to be able to do to be successful in their lives and meet their goals. 
and half of Americans don't have enough comfort and, and confidence in their technology skills to continue to learn, which means moving forward as technology continues to be part of our lives and it changes and evolves, people don't have the skills to keep up. And so that's why it's so important. That's the sort of framing of the issue as to why Jen and I do the work that we do. All right, so to talk, start with, let's talk about integrating ed tech in the classroom to support digital literacies. So we have to think a little bit, whoops, we have to think a little bit about how to create opportunities for learning. Um, we know that learning opportunities need to be timely, relevant, and connected to learners' lives. Go ahead, Jen. Thank you so much. Jen, thanks for doing the slides. I appreciate it. So technology use in and of itself does not produce better learning outcomes for students. So we need to think about using technology to meet two goals. One is creating digital literacies so that people can, in support of content learning, and another is as do, in doing that, pushing their development of new, new literacy skills, new digital literacy skills. And so there's a couple of things that have come up as being really important here. One is to have one-to-one -one devices. People need a device in their hands at the time that they need it. In, as they're learning. It's not something that you teach someone and then they go off and do later. They need a, a device, a single device for a single person in their hand at that time. Second, that technology needs to not be used for just drills and practice, but in fact to promote critical thinking and problem solving. So it's not just rote learning. We don't want to use technology just for rote learning. In fact, it's better to use it for problem solving and critical thinking. Another guiding principle here is to use technology on the activities that students are confident about and do teacher and more instructor guided instruction for the things that are new or that they're less confident about. So this kind of goes back to the principle of how many new things do you want to be doing at the same time. You don't want to be using a new tool at the same time you're talking about new content at the same time that you may be using new language. So this idea that we want to use technology on those things learners are confident about. And then we want to make sure that the technology that's being used in pursuit of digital literacy development aligns with the learning objectives, looking for what, what, is, what is it we want to have happen with our learners. So not we want to avoid the, what I call the cool tools problem and others have called the cool tools problem, this idea that we use a tool because it has a feature we think is cool. Instead, we really need to be driven by what are the learning objectives that we, what we have in our instruction and in our tutoring. So, okay. Thank you, Jen. So one of the things that's really helpful is to consult a framework. And in our, in our research brief, we've talked briefly about three different frameworks. Uh, it really can help a teacher to think about how to integrate a tool or a technology to support learning. The first one is the techno the T we call TPAC, the Technological Pedagogical Contact Knowledge, which looks at the kinds of knowledge that teachers need to have in order to think about integrating technology in a way that helps learning. The second one is called the SAMR model, which is substitution, augmentation, modification, and, re and redefinition. Um, and that's this idea that the different ways that technology can enhance or transform education, to really be thinking about how is learning either enhanced or transformed. And then the triple E framework, and these links are all in the research brief. Um, you're welcome to go there to find them. Triple E provides, uh, the, looks at the degree to which the technology helps students to meet learning goals. Um, and provides a framework for teachers to evaluate tools in light of those goals, of those pedagogical goals. Okay, Jen, go ahead. All right, another thing we need to do is create opportunities to support basic computer skills. And in to do that, we need to first of all teach relevant vocabulary. Then we need to think about the variety of grouping strategies. Rather than having the teacher, as part, the teacher model and the students do, and that's part of how it works. But the other thing we need to pay attention to is having students work in groups to solve problems with their technology or to do something with technology and also to work alone. Because what we've seen is that productive struggle is really important in digital literacy acquisition. This idea that people need to make mistakes, they need to discover what they're looking for, uh, because how many times have you logged in and something is completely different now than it was yesterday? And that's part of technology. Technology, as we know, is continuing to change. So, it, and it will always continue to change. So part of the mindset, part of actually digital literacy is the expectation that it will change and that one will make mistakes and that one is gonna have to discover how to do this thing next. Uh, peer support is also really important. This idea with grouping strategies that that's people learn 
and expect that they'll get help from each other because no one person knows it all when it comes to digital literacy. Um, knowledge is very much distributed. And so this idea that we help each other in peer support in our classes is really important. Thanks, Jen. All right, so another thing to think about to create learning opportunities is to use what students know. Um, and that doesn't matter what language they know it in, right? So many of our students use text and they use it, they use it in all the different languages that they interact in. Uh, texting has been shown to be really effective, like nudging where a, a program or a teacher will send a text to their student, reminding the students of an upcoming assignment uh, uh, or a deadline of some kind promotes engagement and even attendance. Um, text can also be a mechanism for delivering micro lessons. This idea that people can have little self access on demand uh, micro learnings that they can do when they're available, when learning is available. So people can be lifelong learners as long as they want, whenever they want. Social media is something a lot of our students use. Um, they use it for, and, and in social media are opportunities for collaboration and peer learning and even participants, so this is uh, some studies that actually that Jen was involved with, even participants with beginning levels of print literacy could use social media to interact with others and that foster their critical literacy skills. Some really nice research there about how social media, Susan Gare has also done some really, really good work on using social media uh, to supplement classroom learning and to promote uh, engagement and collaboration with our students. And because technology is always changing, we need to pay attention and continue to pay attention to what our students know, what they're already expert in, so not everything that we do with them is new. All right, Jen, go ahead. Thank you. Another thing that's really important as we create learning opportunities for students is to make technology relevant um, for both academic skill development and to do the things that students need to be able to do with their lives. For academic skills, certainly there's lots and lots of technology that is that a lots and lots of relevance there, whether it's doing research, it's reading online, making class presentations, critical thinking skills, and so on. But it's also these skills are needed and need to be relevant to students' lives. So for example, when people need to communicate with their child's teacher, this is a skill they need to have both technologically and linguistically. They need to be able to read the school calendar. They need to be able to search for and apply for jobs. And that information is online and it takes technology skills. Digital literacies are required for that. And in the context of health, increasingly, and COVID has shown us this just every day, how important um, digital literacies are for participating in one's healthcare. Everything from filling out medical forms to communicating providers and increasingly accessing patient portals. I mean, patient portals are really important for getting test results high quality health information, making appointments and so on. So our students need to be able to use technology to both learn the content knowledge that they are learning in your program, but also for the things they need to be able to do in their lives. All right, Jen. All right, people often think that learning digital literacies is a one and done, and that it's a solitary activity between a device and a learner, but it isn't. Human connection is very important. And this often surprises people when, when we talk about it. But human connection, connection is really important when learning new digital skills, when struggling, as we all do, when something doesn't work, we get stuck. And to find relevance for people who think that I don't, this doesn't matter to me, human connection helps people to see, oh, this does matter to me. Yes, this is relevant to my life and I do wanna learn how to do this. So building opportunities for human connection, and there's lots and lots of ways programs have done that. They do it through tutoring programs, volunteer programs, um, many to one, one to one classes, all of these kinds of things. Drop in telephone, and during COVID, we see this happening in telephone uh, helplines and so on. But building opportunities for human connection is really important. And then lastly, providing opportunities to create content is another opportunity something that's very important when building in uh, opportunities to integrate technology to support digital literacies and that is whereas we used to think in the old days we used to think that using the internet was for very passive things to find information to uh, get things but now what we know is our learners need and want to be able to create content and that might be making any kind of multimedia that might be making how-to videos on YouTube, create or post music or music videos, write blogs and being activists on social media and so on, right? Our students need to be able to create content 
Um, it is an opportunity to share their voice, to have a voice in their world, but also it supports project-based learning. This idea that when you do a project in your classroom, using multimedia tools is very, it, it creates similar skills to traditional paper and pencil. And it really, and the, so that's an example of the using, using technology for two things. One is pushes the content knowledge forward, but also in doing so creates new media skills. So these are some of the things that we need to think about as we create opportunities for learning in our classrooms um, with technology to push digital literacy forward. All right, now Jen, I think you're gonna talk about the next section of our paper. Yeah, and as I'm transitioning over, I just encourage you to just reflect for a second and throw a question about the instructional um, oriented content that Kathy just, just covered. Um, start brainstorming so that when we go to breakout sessions, we'll have something to talk about. So all of the um, instructional brilliance in the world won't do a thing if there isn't programmatic support for integrating technologies and supporting digital literacy development um, in, in our classrooms or remote instruction and distance education. Um, so I have three or four different sort of content areas to talk about here. Um, uh, areas that we found really salient in the research as we were as we were going through our literature review. Um, the first area is around partnerships. Partnerships play a critical role in supporting technology integration because they help education program uh, education providers leverage resources from from organizations that have like um, sort of a like mission or might support the same types of learners. Partnerships can make make certain that we have that learners have access to digital learning opportunities beyond what happens in a formal education. So, for example, there might be a drop in digital literacy support service available at um, a community based organization that might do workforce development or in cat like as Kathy has seen in her research, either in public housing sites or in um, health uh, uh, health. Um, providers, healthcare providers. So using digital literacy resources, these programs can take resources created by ABE providers, so there's a benefit to them too, to help learners navigate their websites and access the services that they're providing. Um, one limitation of partnerships is that they often start, um, according to what we read, they often start with a, a grant, with a short-term goal. So if it is to sustain and endure beyond that discrete project, you need to start embedding um, sustainability strategies right from the very beginning. I'd like to elevate one example of a partnership that we found that many of you might know about, the English Plus initiative, integration initiative created by the Migration Policy Institute's National Center on Immigration Integration Policy, aims to connect community-based organizations with, with education providers, um, um, public health officials, early childhood education services, and social service providers. So stakeholders from all of these organizations might come together in order to identify their shared pool of participants. And the 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 CBOs can 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 leverage the 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 the, the expertise of the English language um, instructors, and they can also leverage the 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 expertise in the digital literacy in digital literacy area to make sure that as immigrants and refugees are settling into new com communities, they have comprehensive integration support that helps them with education, digital access, and language education. Um, this program is actually was started before the pandemic, and um, one promising implementation model of this is the Lifting Immigrant Family Trajectories. It's an, in, um, an initiative um, from that center is in Denver, I believe, centers around a series of workshops on integration topics that are interwoven with digital literacy supports and English language lessons. So they get through joint planning, the learners are getting everything they need through visiting this one organization and through this tight partnership um, across the, 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 the different providers. So I hope you'll check out the paper to read a little bit more about that. You can also go to the Migration Policy Institute website, which I've linked to here, to read what, one of the initial reports that MPI published on this really innovative and useful model. The next thing I want to touch on briefly is just the impact of professional learning. Um, effective professional development is super important in this area, particularly because as Kathy noted just a few minutes ago, technology is constantly changing. Like you might log into a website one day and see something completely different from the next. So 
PD needs to be ongoing. Teachers need to be taught how to do problem solving and to have some digital fluency um, and to be able to apply learnings across different contexts when, when they're learning. In order to make this happen, PD needs to be really relevant and aligned with program goals so that we're learning more from a thematic or, or context-based perspective rather than like focusing on discrete and siloed skills. Um, PD also needs to align with a lot of the stuff that we know from um, the good work of Linda Darling Hammond. Um, effective PD has a focus on content, provides active learning experiences, is aligned with teacher beliefs and program goals, sustained over time, has ample opportunities for collaboration, and as Darling Hammond points out, also need, need, we need to have after PD is over, have some ample, we have ample um, ongoing technical support available. An example of this that I would like to share is a course actually authored by us at the EdTech Center at World Ed. After we turned in the draft, but it's a, such a good example, I wanted to share it here um, as, as um, a concrete um, example. Um, the Transforming Distance Education course was funded by Octa. We created it last summer, and it is a series of modules that covers topics that represent the range of considerations you might need in order to create or beef up or scale up a distance education program. They're online on the website, the link just got chatted, and um, teachers can engage with these independently. Um, they're interactive self-paced modules. But what we have noticed is at least four states and several large community-based organizations have asked for copies the, this is um, Creative Commons license, it's open access. They've taken them and put them in their own learning management systems, and they're creating professional learning communities for teachers to come together to make use of these media, and then discuss what's going on and apply the learning into their own instruction. So just by doing that, we've got focus on, um, we've got active learning experiences because they're transferring what's happening into their work. It's sustained, the PLCs meet together over time, there's collaboration collaboration. Um, so I guess the point is you can take almost any online interactive learning object and turn it into an extended and rich learning experience for teachers by embedding this into a professional learning community. And then the final area I would like to touch on is on access. I think this is perhaps one of the most important considerations when you're thinking about technology integration and digital literacy development. Um, from an equity perspective, you can't do anything if, if teachers and learners alike lack access. Um, so access to digital tools and activities shouldn't just be thought of like for, for one level of education or one group of students, but rather should be understood as like being integral to programming like all adults needs across any program um, that is going to be relying on technology. Um, also, you know, there's there's been there's been research that shows that actually having this access does it, it, when it when it's coupled with support when it's not just access alone but when it's coupled with support can lead to not only people learning things but increased empowerment and agency and civic participation that that learners can then use to leverage and make their own choices about learning in the future. An example of this is our, these digital navigator programs that you might have heard about popping up across the country. Um, many programs leveraging CARES Act funding have been able to, county, to partner with county and community-based organization, maybe community college partners, in order to create lending programs that are paired with digital skills support and technology uh, or technical assistance. Um, these places tend to be located in places that are convenient for learners, which is right now online, but um, conceived to be happening in libraries, um, one stops American job centers. Um, there are even some nascent examples of this, of like this happening in um, boxing gyms or in cafes where there's somebody there that can provide access to a device and or but most critically give um, support for digital skills instruction and, and making use of that device. So if you would like to see what needs to go into creating one of these programs, I encourage you to check out the link that just got chatted. The EdTech Center has created a resource website for programs that are interested in setting up their own digital navigator programs. Um, so I, I encourage you to check that out as well. Okay, so it's we actually made it in the allotted time, I think. Um, are there any quick questions that we should resolve before we go into breakout groups? 
I'm not you seeing can, You can unmute yourself or type it into the chat. I, ha I have one question for you guys. Um, given the pandemic and the fact that most programs were using remote learning anyway, um, how how is what you're talking about either you know different or additive to what programs probably mostly have been doing for the last year? Uh, so since you said program, I can start at the programmatic level, and then Kathy, if you want to awesome. dive into the instructional level. Um, well, I think that what we, I, I'm not sure that if what we would have written would have changed entirely. Like the re, a lot of the foundational research and the ideas probably would have stayed the same as the examples that are changed. So that's why actually I had a hard time ignoring what I know now and not including new examples, stuff that has emerged since the pandemic. Um, I think what's happening is the, the field is becoming more equitable in terms of access to devices and quality remote and online instruction because of the necessity. I think there were pockets of quality and excellence that we were all really like looking hard to find, but what's happening now is that they're, they're everywhere. Um, so I'm hoping this is like a downstream, you know, the, the, there's momentum that's going to continue the field sort of marching forward there. Kathy, you want to add anything? Some of what I've seen is how people who before were dabbling on integra integrating digital literacy into their classrooms are now doing it fully and require and, and having to push the instructors, push their own learning forward in ways they hadn't thought about before. Um, and providing a lot more and learning that they can provide support themselves to their learners um and doing whatever it takes the multimodality that it takes to get learners especially very low level learners uh to engage um they've slowed down they're doing less but they're supporting it more even if that means you call up a learner and you know you do something over the telephone so i i have seen people get really creative um but i think jen jen's right the basic things we've learned haven't changed but people have had to be more of their teachers have had to be more of their own support and they've also had to expand the ways that they support learners. Yeah. I see there's a question from David. Can I just follow up real oh, quickly? Yeah. Um, I just having, um, because I'm interviewing teachers now about um, you know, where they are a year later, I think it's also really important to distinguish between we're using technology um, for everything we do distinguish that from we're teaching digital literacy because I think that using technology in the classroom just to sort of get material across is not necessarily the same as promoting digital literacy. So I wondered if you want to comment on that really quickly and then we'll take David's question. I think that's a really good point to make. And, and, and I think one of the things that we did find in the research we reviewed for this research brief is using technology in and of itself doesn't push learning forward. It doesn't create greater learning outcomes. You've got to be able to use learning for the content, use the technology for the content learning, as well as develop the skills and push the skills forward, right, to, to, to do that. So, um, and I think, Alisa, that's a really good point, is in, during COVID, we've used technology as, a, as a, a way to get stuff to people, not necessarily <clears throat> instructionally. But I think by, by doing that, I think it's developed a lot of teachers' confidence. That might really help. That might make a big difference. And it's developed learners' confidence too, I think. Yeah. For when we do kind of move past emergencies into day-to-day -day instruction. So we have actually, uh, can I, I'll just add to that. So I, Lisa and I are sort of on a parallel project with eBay's here where we're interviewing teachers. And at the EdTech Center, we have been interviewing remote teachers that have been engaged, engaged in remote ESOL instruction. And <clears throat> I was most recently on the phone with teachers from Carlos Rosario International Public Charter School who actually have been doing a pre and post digital literacy assessment with their learners who were engaged in remote ESOL instruction and their skills actually did increase, at least on that assessment. The other thing I want to say in terms of um, supports is that that's only possible if there are the supports. Like, they're not just going to figure it out necessarily on the own, their own because they have to. In fact, the surest way to deprive a learner of agency and learning is to throw an unaccomplishable task in front of them. So pushing digital literacy skills while you're doing language instruction or other academic content areas is only good if you've got the adequate support to make to make sure they can succeed. And then so David, oh, go ahead, Jen. You're well, David's question here. Um, so 
It's interesting in my writing lately, I have been trying to not just use the word technology. I've been saying integrating digital technologies. A pencil is a technology. Okay, so we, the novelty of a technology shifts as it becomes more popularized. Okay, so now we're, 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 we're when we're talking about technology, we're, I'm really thinking about digital technologies. And I'm imagining a day where, you know, a mobile device is the same thing as a pencil in a classroom. I, you know, I don't, I don't know, that may or may not happen. I, but I, I don't think we're like in a post-technology recognition phase or era yet. I think it's still important to be explicit when we're talking about the skills needed to use these tech, these digital technologies. And so for that reason, I think we do still need to talk about conscious integration of the technologies into the teaching and learning that happens. Kathy, do you want to add anything? Yeah. And I, thanks, David. That's a great question. Um, Cause I, you know, I've risked resisted kind of conflating technology integration with digital literacies. Cause I think those are related, but different things. And I, um, but one of the things that I, let's see, let's see if I, did I forget my point? Oh, I might have forgotten my point. Uh, I forgot. Hopefully it'll come back to me. Gosh, it just went away. Well, while you're thinking of it, Kathy, can you just say a little bit more about the difference between digital literacy and integrating technology? Because you said, I think they're two different things. Yes, and I also remembered what I was going to say. So let me just finish what I was going to say, because I think it relates, at least, to your question. And that is that um, I think with when we talk about integrating technology, it's using technology to do the different kind of things that we need to do. And that's everything from knowing how to, um, from a teacher's point of view, to thinking a little bit about what are the, what, what is technology and, and how does it come into my classroom. And I think that if we don't stop and think carefully about it, can really lead us to the cool tools, what I call the cool tools program. I didn't, didn't invent that, but the cool tools program problem where people will take a technology or a tool and say, all right, how do we use this to push our learning forward? Instead of my students need to know how to do X, Y, and Z in their lives and for their academic skill, their academic career, right? So how, what is the best way for them to acquire those things and those skills? And the digital literacies are the things they need to be able to do to accomplish those goals. Um, whereas I think the technology, if we talk about just technology integration, it tends to focus more on the, the things. So they're certainly related, but technology integration doesn't want really to talk about skills. It doesn't talk about what are the things that people need to be able to do. Um, so I think we, you know, Jen, I think you make a really good point. We still need to have both of, we need, we need to think about both of those things still. Even yeah, the I, digital technologies. I think of it as just like another material that's a, required to accomplish an activity or, or implement some sort of pedagogy. It's, you know, you need, you need a PDF or you might need a book or you might need this worksheet, but in like the, the technology resources or the, the devices themselves could be kind of classified as, you know, those types of media or um, equipment. Okay, so thank you for that clarification. We have one more, one more question. And then if nothing else pops up, we're gonna go into small discussion groups for several minutes. So. The next question comes from Barbara. Can you speak to integrating synchronous, asynchronous, and live digital technologies in teaching and learning? Oh, just a tiny little question. <laughs> well, they, that's, those are all modalities of instruction that are happening now. Um, I'm not sure where to go with this question. Can well, you speak to how, yeah, how I, where I would go with this was is that um, I think that where we are today in many of these things is to think about the learners and our learners goals and our curricular goals and what is the right right combination of things that meet those goals. Mm. And some of it might be synchronous, some of it might be synchronous, some of it might be face to face or live right But it's I think we have to think of making a cake, what are the different ingredients that meet the needs of this group of, of people uh, and the goals that, that we all have together so. I think we have to think of the mixing and matching because we now have, have all these great things that are possible yeah. and what works for whom for at what time. I agree. We're, I'm, I'm running a study group right now with a bunch of teachers in Arizona who are piloting the high flex model, which blends asynchronous um, in person and live remote instruction and in equitable ways so that learners can participate in any way. And you're absolutely right, Kathy. They're actually finding that the schools themselves don't necessarily have the technologies available to them to, to provide an equitable learning experience across those different modalities. Um, so they are busy trying to gain cameras 
and mic systems that, that create really wonderful learning opportunities for learners, whether they're in the classroom or they're sitting at home in front of their computers. Um, yeah, so yeah, again, it's just like matching, like as Kathy said, matching the modality with technology that's required to support it. Okay, thank you so much. So at this point, we're going to break into small groups. I really, I know the temptation is great to break away at this point, but I encourage you to stay because I think the opportunity to talk with other practitioners about what you've just heard in terms of your own practice, either what you're already doing that fits with this and sort of checking in with other people about how do you do this, how do you do that, and also thinking about what's something new you wanna try as a result of what you heard today, or what's something new you wanna look into at least as a next step. And I think there's two reasons to do this in community. One is I just think that saying out loud to other people something you wanna try makes it more likely that you actually will instead of just going back to your regular life at three o'clock. Um, but I also think hearing from other people can stimulate you to think about things either you didn't quite pick up in the presentation or you hadn't thought of, or hey, if someone else is trying this, maybe we could. So we're going to uh, randomly place you into groups. Uh, we're going to give you about, um, let's say, 13 minutes. According to my computer, it's 2.42. So we will come back at that point, and that will just be an opportunity for people to kind of share something that's on their mind as a result of the discussion. And then uh, we'll end at 3 o'clock, but our presenters will hang around, sort of like in the hallway after a presentation, if you want to speak to them in a little bit more intimate setting. So with that, I'm gonna have Todd do his magic, put you all in rooms, uh, really addressing those two questions. What's something you're already doing that resonates with what you heard today? What's something you wanna try? And I'm gonna strongly encourage that someone in the group take the role of saying, mm, let's each go for about two minutes or let's make sure everyone gets a couple of minutes to talk um, and moving on and giving everyone an opportunity. So with that, I'm gonna bid you adieu for about 12 minutes, 12, yep. 15 minutes. Go ahead, Todd. No, and everybody, you will automatically go to a breakout room and when time is up, you will automatically come back here. So we'll see you in 13 minutes. Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. We are, um, we've lost, a lot of people have left us, but it's kind of nice in the last few minutes in a more intimate crowd to hear um, from you all. And this is an opportunity to just say one thing that's on your mind that was new to you or that you want to try or that really stood out for you, either from your discussion or the presentation. You can just unmute yourself. Um, if you'd like to speak. Uh, I really like, I, I spoke to Gwen, and she's in North Carolina, and um, I really like it that her school, they put, they bumped up the Wi-Fi on the side of the office so students have a place to go to do their work online. You know, mm -hmm. that's really a, a wonderful thing. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to my administrator about that. That's great. Thank you. Someone else want to go? Something new that stood out for you? Go ahead. Uh, well, not, not so much not so much new, but um, I, during an in-service, we were we were trained in blended learning. So our, our the the people in our um, adult basic education for college and career program, uh, we're you know we have done a lot of things in terms of blended learning and asynchronous uh, instruction. Although as a math teacher, I prefer synchronous instruction because I like the immediate feedback that I can give the students. Um, but what I really like to uh, learn more about is the high flex model, uh, which we're, we're piloting. We, but, but, that's, but the frustration for me is the, the um, it's only in three classrooms. And so, I mean, there's just so much that you can do with that. With our, our budget, there, there's no way that we can provide that for every, everybody in the, in the program. Yeah, that's a fairly resource intensive strategy, but it does raise, um, it does create equity issues for people who can't actually come or found it much easier to participate online than, mm -hmm. um, than to actually get there in person. Again, the person I was just interviewing this morning 
said that their students are so uh, liking being able to come online that she's afraid that they actually won't come. I may back. never show up again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's actually my issue a little bit. At the beginning of the year of the pandemic, uh, you know, it was a challenge technically and all that. Now that my students are so familiar with it and they don't want to go back to in person. They, you know, it's so convenient. And yeah. I'm a little bit concerned having that mixed model, some online, some in person, because, you know, you can't really create that community with the ones that would be online if I'm there with the ones in person. Mm -hmm. but anyway, I think the challenge is to learn how to do that. Can I speak yeah. to that really quickly? Yes, please. Yeah. So yeah. In, in our study group, what we're noticing is that the students that are so excited about sticking to the, the, the remote part of the high flex model are mm -hmm. those that stuck that persisted through the pandemic because they didn't they didn't want to come to the program anyway. So what we're looking forward to understanding better in the fall when new students come is if those new students were the ones that stopped like that stopped out because they didn't want to learn online mm -hmm. so so what we're noticing now might just be because of the time we're in um and the students you, you have right now are the ones that want to be online so those are the ones that are going to not come in if they have a choice but that's not everybody no it certainly isn't and there are some students i mean i i did get um some emails um before sessions um started uh in march the end of March last of last year that told me um, I'm very uncomfortable, you know, working online and I'll, you know, I'll wait it out until, you know, you return face to face. I mean, there are students that just, they don't like working online. So I hope everyone saw um, Jen's uh, chat that they'll be presenting on a high flex model at when you say Arizona September conference, you mean the pro literacy conference, right? Yes. No, no, no. I'm I'm actually talking about Arizona State Conference, but State that's, Conference. let's just call that the test run of the first iteration of that work. And I, as their pilots mature, I I would love to, um, you know, be able to have a broader audience for that. Right. If they're and willing. Also, and also note that David Rosen said in the next in the um, is it the next issue? There'll be a uh, column uh, in the next Pro Literacy Journal, the Adult Literacy Education Journal, there'll be a column on flex models. At this point, we're at the hour. Um, Barbara's asking for more information on the Arizona State Conference. Um, I'm afraid I have to leave. So I will uh, say thank you all for coming. If you want to stay for a few minutes, uh, Jen and Kathy will stay on and I'll leave it to Jen and Kathy to answer the question about the Arizona State Conference. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye -bye. Thank you. Is Barbara still here? Yeah, I'm. I'm here. Oh, hi, Barbara. I, I'd have to Google that myself. I don't have the link. I'm going to Google oh, it if people want to okay. ask questions, and I'll see if I can find it. It's their state Great. conference, and it is virtual. Um, so uh, I'm sure. Okay. Oh, good. I don't have to drive very far. Yeah. Are you in Arizona? I'm in California. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Um, I've got like seven more minutes. I can hang here. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to add that in, in Springfield, Missouri, one of our uh, centers does have a daycare, a free daycare for, wow. I mean, in the same building. Uh, it's only certain mornings a week, but um, you know, the mothers or fathers can come uh, during that time with their children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a lure for sure, a way to get mm -hmm. people supported so they can come in. Right. And Jen, I just wanted to thank you for, for bringing that point because I, you know, I didn't even think about the students that might have wanted to come to the program, but because of it was online that they didn't come. So yeah that gives it, me some hope thank you it's so interesting well it's so interesting i mean it, we're it's david rosen was talking about courage and risks in in our small group and as mm -hmm. educators you are you are all taking risks and have to have courage mm -hmm. as you're pushing into these new instructional models and using new technologies um so everybody here is a rock star you know you're you're all working so hard 
Yeah, and then coordinating those is really tough. I mean, I get, I love just showing up to the classroom, you know, prepared with all my Xerox, um, you know, the work that we were going to do in the class. And um, but now, you know, it forced me into, you know, ex, you know, embracing the digital digital technology. And I'm really glad that it did because it opened up uh, so many possibilities for us. I have a question for you about the high flex and the blend flex models. Can you uh, tell us just a little bit more about what that is? And, and what, you know. what I'm going to do is chat a link to a book. Um, and it's, it's an easy to read short book. Um, okay. And the reason I'm going to do that is I am, this is new to me. Um, mm -hmm. But essentially, you, you're creating an opportunity for learners to engage with instructional content in the modality that suits them at any given moment. Um, so they could show up to class, they could tune in by camera, or they could learn asynchronously, like they could engage with the content online through a learning management system. Um, Brian Beatty at University or San Francisco State University has done like the seminal research and writing on this topic. And I just chatted the link to um, an open access textbook that is really cool because the last chapter is a bunch of case studies that people are writing about their high flex implementation. So you can actually read what practitioners are saying. Most of this is higher ed. There are a couple of community and technical college programs that have case studies in there. Um, but I, I encourage you to check it out. The key here is that you need to provide equitable learning experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's it's designing for a new way of teaching and learning. It's it and and so it's it's I think that the learning curve is quite steep probably at the very beginning, but I think that it's probably worth it if we're if our goal is to support persistence for learners who can't commit to coming in all the time. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for this uh, conference today. I'm glad I I slipped in to see it. And it was, yeah, just really good information. Thank you. Um, Jen, would that be the IDEA conference September 13th through 15th? No, it's their actual state Department okay. of Ed conference. All right. I'm not having a lot of luck. It, may, it might not be posted yet. It's so early. It may not be. Yeah. Well, I need to I need to sneak off. I have a meeting starting shortly. Um, so I'll sneak off, Kathy. Okay, I'll answer questions if, if there are any. Thanks so much, everybody. Take Thanks, care. Jen. Thank you, Jen. Bye, Jen. Bye, Jen. Well, if I could just say one mm -hmm. thing. A year ago, I met Jen because I started writing on the Lynx um, website about my developing a uh, way to teach learners who only had a phone, who didn't have a computer. From March 13th to March 15th, I figured out how to teach them using WhatsApp. And I initially said to Jen that none of my students ever wanted to learn anything digital. But I found that once my students had to learn, because we had a very supportive program that put in place computer instruction an hour a day, five days a week, Wow. And then I was teaching them 20 hours. By the time we had to do the lockdown the second time, they were so happy to go to Google Meets with me every day. They didn't lose a minute. I didn't lose one student. And we all learned a tremendous amount in the last several months. I never thought that I would be here. <laughs> Good for you, yeah. right? That's great. I mean, the stories that we hear from the cool things people are doing, that they've been resourceful, um, helping their students to figure stuff out as the need came up, meeting the students where they were. But, mm -hmm. you know, as Jen said, we mustn't forget there were students and there's a lot of them who just didn't come. Right. Mm -hmm. Some estimates say up to 50 percent, depending yeah. on the kind of program. Yeah. Um, but what a wonderful story, Nan, about about how to do that, how to just sort of get through it. I mean, our research has shown it's relevance. It's people seeing, you know, I don't want digital technologies, but then when they say, oh, look what I can do, they're like, oh, and then, oh, oh, this is important to me. This is something of interest to me. This is something that's useful to me. When it was necessary, you know, mother is the necessity of invention. 
So when it was necessary and we had no choice, that's what we did. And then after we did it because we had to, then we started feeling the finding advantages. And, and now my students, they go into breakout rooms, they do activities together, just like they'd be doing in the classroom. It took us a very long time to get to that place, but they're all excited about coming back in September. Yeah. I think there's also elements of the other things that, that Kathy and Jen talked about, about the, the problem solving with technology and kind of the social nature of engaging in technology and kind of the necessity of a group of people figuring that out together and then having gone through that experience together and it forms it, it does it forms a bond that kind of leads them to support each other uh you know down the road i think i your experience i think is a lot of other programs that we talk to are, are seeing similar experiences with students that kind of stuck together as a group and figured it out how to do it and and are now in a place where they they find it really rewarding. Yeah. Not only did we build a learning community, but when they were in breakout rooms, they were allowed to speak their native languages in order to teach each other, share their screens with each other, learn and develop from each other. And of course, that's the real excitement, you know? That's like yeah. John Dewey. That's like <laughs> learning like together in in a normal way, in a collectivist culture kind of way, learning from your peers and uh, having a real reason to do it. So, you know, that was just so exciting. That's yeah. great, it's so yeah. exciting. Yeah, I did that in early on, uh, most, I was teaching pre-lit, um, you know, lower level uh, learners, and they came on with their their cell phones onto Zoom. And, um, and I would, you know, I found that they, they would show up every time and they did have incentive because they, they get money from one of the organizations that support them. Um, but I would just leave Zoom on after the class was over. I'd say, okay, ladies, you can, you can just, I'll leave it on. And when you're done, you know, talking to each other here, you know, that's fine. You just log off when you're ready. And I think that that was something that really helped build community with them you know yeah to just let them let them have the technology to use it the way that they want and not be so in control of it as the teacher you know that's one of the things in digital literacies that we're seeing is with digital technology with digital literacies you can't really be the sort of sage on the stage kind of teacher yeah. you really have to be the guide on the side kind of teacher because of the changing nature and the fact that everybody knows something different uh, and encouraging people to find what's relevant to them, right? Um, and discovery, the fact that the teacher doesn't always know. We don't know, we can't. Yeah. So, and that and, pushes uh, us towards more student-centered learning, actually. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think as a teacher, sometimes it's hard to give that up. You know, you, 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 buy, all, you buy into the idea, but, um, for me, I buy into that idea, but can I really practice it? And that, that's been a big challenge for me that, you know, having to use this, this technology has helped me with, you know, creating more uh, student-centered work. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah we're entering a really uh, in, incredible age. I mean, it's, it's a renaissance, you know, in teaching. I think we're, we're, we're seeking out the best ways to use the technology towards education. You know, when you see so many examples in our society where the uh, technology is really used to trash people and, you know, so I, I feel so fortunate to be in, an educator at this time, you know. Yeah. It's June, did you want to? Thanks. Huh? I just, I think June, I think you were trying to say something. June. No, I'm just enjoying listening to this because I try to get people to the resources, you know, where they can set up a Zoom account, you know, and try it. And, you know, I try to get people to, to move forward and, 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 you know, view our webinars, you know, so that they can try it. And I'm actually like a one on one tutor and I suck at technology, you know. I had a. <laughs> 
I don't have a cell phone, you know, and she wanted to learn how to text. I'm like, here, come. I had her grandkids come over and teach us how to text, you know, because I didn't know how to do it, you know, but I knew we could do it. We could figure it out. We just had to figure out, you know, what her goals were and how to do it. So I'm just loving listening to everything you're saying. And I'm sorry, I have to run. Sorry. Well, I, we probably